If you have a copy of God's Word and want to open it with me, we'll be in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 26 this morning. For those of you that remain, this is the Word of the Lord. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. They were all continually in prayer along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up from among the brothers and sisters. The number of people who were together was about 120 and said, Brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the scripture be fulfilled, the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David foretold about Judas, who had become a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was one of our number and shared in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wages. He fell head first, his body burst open, and his intestines spilled out. He became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that field is called Hekeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling become desolate, let no one live in it, and let someone else take his position. Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, from among these it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's hearts. You know which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this apostolic ministry that Jesus left to go when, where he belongs. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. Let's pray. Father, this morning we pause to thank you for your word, God, to thank you for your spirit. Father, we pray that the vision that Ryan cast a few moments ago for Word Partners would certainly be the reality here this morning. Um, Father, that we would see your word alive and active, ready to transform our hearts, pass through the preacher and into our hearts, Father, and that it would lead not just to knowing more about your word or being um, more biblically literate, Father, but that it would penetrate our hearts, that it would cause transformation, repentance, obedience, obedience, Father, that it would give us a, a playbook for how to live this week and into this rest of this season of our lives. Father, we love you. We ask that you bless this time, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. So really, our text this morning, our goal was to answer two questions. Um, one of them first, what were the early followers of Jesus? As we look back at this story in Acts, in the very beginning of this book, we'll spend quite a bit of time on, what were these early followers of Jesus doing as the first church is beginning? Um, and so in just a short while, this group of believers that we will look at and talk about this morning will become the first church. And so day to day, what does it look like for the lives of these believers? What are they up to as this church is about to be launched? And then simply by extension, why does it matter what they were doing to us 2,000 years later? What here in this text is applicable? What do we carry with us? And what do we leave on the side? Last week, we covered two of the most important stories in the book of Acts. And so this book that's 28 chapters, that's long, Last week, when we looked at the command in Acts 1-8, the command to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into all the world, that's a really important moment in the book of Acts. It's the climax of the book in many ways. And then we also got the ascension of Jesus, where his disciples got to watch him rise back up into heaven. And so those two things took place last week. Next week in Acts chapter 2, we get the story of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, absolutely a pillar on which the book of Acts is written. We get the coming of the Holy Spirit and all that that means for the lives of the believers in the church. I'm comfortable saying that those two things, the Acts 1-8 text and the ascension of Jesus is one event together, and then the Pentecost text next week are the two most important books, central text in the book of Acts. But in the middle today, we have a text that almost feels a little odd. At least it did for me this week, looking over it and prepping for it. There's this 10-day period in between those two pillars where the pace of the story completely changes. 
we simply see a group of believers, this group that will in just a moment become the first church on the earth, living out their daily lives. They're going throughout their normal routine. And this text provides the modern church, our church today, with four healthy examples of what it simply looks like to walk with and follow Jesus. Our main idea this morning is this, and it's in your worship guides if you have one. As you seek to follow Jesus, join together in prayer, obey God's word, and trust in his sovereignty. As you seek to follow Jesus, join together in prayer, obey God's word, and trust in his sovereignty. So the first example of faithfully following Jesus comes in verse 12. All the way back in the text that we looked at last week, there's the command in Acts 1-8, but there's actually another command that Jesus gives to his followers. In verse 4, Jesus gives his followers a really explicit command. They are to remain in Jerusalem, and they're to wait there for the Holy Spirit that will be coming. And at first, that command seems strange. Remember, this is a group that's seen Jesus. They've walked alongside him throughout his life and ministry. They've experienced transformation in their own hearts through the power of the gospel, and they've just been commissioned to be gospel witnesses everywhere in the world, and they've seen their Lord ascend back up into heaven. But for now, in this moment in our text today, they're commanded to stay still. They're told to remain where they are. They're restricted in where they can go and what they can do. Do you feel the tension in this part of the text this morning? Have you ever been in a spot in your life where you've known there's something really important coming down the track, and maybe you're excited about it, maybe you're nervous and you're anxious about it, but either way, you're ready to get at it. You're ready to start. You're ready to unpack it and figure out exactly what you're dealing with. You're ready to lean in. But for whatever reason in a season of life like that, you're being held back, you're being restrained. If any part of these early followers were chomping at the bit to get to this important work that the Lord had called them to, for now, they're in exactly that position. They're being held back. They're being told to wait. And yet in this tension, how do we see Jesus' followers respond? And it's clear, they respond in complete obedience to the Lord. Whatever questions they may have had, we're told that they return from their meeting with Jesus, they gather together in the upper room, and they wait. There's a really beautiful example, I think, of the simplicity of as we're seeking to follow Jesus, this kind of obedience is expected and it's important. It's a pillar on which following the Lord is built. Verses 13 through 14 are also important because they're centered around the discipline of prayer. So Luke doesn't give us any details when he said that they were praying together of what that prayer time looked like. We don't get an agenda. We don't get a list of topics. All of that is left open. But we do know two things for certain in this text. We know for sure that these early believers prioritized praying consistently, and so they are praying often, and we also know that they valued praying together. And so first, this idea of praying consistently is woven all throughout Scripture. We see it all the way back in the Old Testament. The prophet Jeremiah, in his book, chapter 29, verse 12, teaches that we should continually seek God, pray to God, and be ready for God-given opportunities. If you were to look forward in the Bible's big stories to later in Paul's life in ministry, in Ephesians 6.18, he encourages the church at Ephesus, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And so this idea of continual persistent prayer is really important for this early group of believers. It was a couple of years ago, our student ministry had an opportunity, um, a challenge to learn something about prayer in real time. At least that was the case for my heart. And so we brought our students on a mission trip to Charlotte, North Carolina a few summers ago. We were ready to hit the ground running. We arrived on the site, um, got our mission assignments. And for most of us that week, our assignment was to partner with a local church plant, a church that had just been planted in the community. And our job was to pray. Our job was to walk around the neighborhoods adjacent to that church and spend most of our time praying for the work, for the ministry, for gospel opportunities, for all of those things on behalf of that church. And when we got those assignments, to be totally honest with you, there was a part of my heart that was a little bit disappointed in that. In my mind, I'm thinking, we've traveled all the way here. It would be so nice if there was something a little bit more tangible, a little bit more hands-on that we could get into during the week. Five to six, sometimes seven hours a day praying feels like a lot. But all throughout that week, the Lord placed this nagging question on my heart. Hey, how much do you really value this kind of prayer, this kind of persistent, consistent prayer? 
At that point, and honestly, as I look at my life even now in real time in the moment, I think there's a part of me that's prone to underestimate just how important this kind of prayer is. I've got a blind spot here if I'm not careful, but what's abundantly clear in our text is that this group of early believers in Acts 1 had a much healthier perspective on just how critical this was. They placed a high value on persistent prayer. And not only does this soon-to-be church pray often, but we also see that they're intentional about praying together in community. And this type of prayer is so healthy for a church because it helps the church to grow in a number of different areas. I read an article by a pastor named Stephen Lee that makes this point. Praying together in unity for a church helps that church to grow their hearts together. And so the Apostle Paul several times in the Bible compares a body of believers, a church, with a physical body. There's this idea that believers are uniquely gifted and sent out that all serve a specific role in serving the church, just like what body has different parts that work and operate in different ways. And if that's the case, this idea of praying together helps to make sure that we're unified in the direction that we're moving. It's the same sheet music that we're operating out of. It's the same playbook that we're using together. Unified prayer helps ensure that one part of the body isn't moving off in another direction and going rogue while the rest are moving in another area. And that's not a coincidence because praying together helps to unify our hearts together. It's not magic that we happen to be moving in the same direction. Our hearts are being fostered for the same thing. We're promoting and putting the same kind of things forward. And so praying together helps align our hearts. Praying together in unity also helps to multiply our strength. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the philosopher, has a line in his book, Life Together, where he says this, the Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain, but his brother's is sure. Let me read that one more time. The Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain. His brother's is sure. That's really powerful. Also, what's that mean? So there's this idea. Have you ever walked with the Lord in your time following Jesus and had a season during that time where it really felt like your faith was holding on by a thread, where it was really a struggle to practice relationship with the Lord, to walk with them. It felt like your faith was waning. It felt like you were just barely holding on. Your heart was prone to wandering. And if you've experienced a season in your walk with Jesus like that, has the Lord ever used a brother and sister in Christ to come alongside you right in the moment that you needed it and help to strengthen you, to pour into you, to disciple you, to help bring you along in your walk with the Lord to renew it. This is one of the beauties of being unified in our prayers. When we pray together, that type of unity makes us stronger. When the Christ in our heart feels weak, it's the Christ in our brother and sisters that come alongside that help step in and give us strength. And all of this makes us infinitely more effective followers of Jesus. Last week, we had Herman and Ella, our Grace Water missionaries here, um, did a great job of casting vision for what ministry in Zimbabwe and Africa looked like. During the Sunday school hour, Herman had a quote, and as soon as he said it, I wrote it down with the intent to deliver it to you guys this morning. Um, He said this, there are no lone rangers that will ever be successful for the kingdom of God. You know, in the years in ministry, I've had quite a few conversations with people who have articulated the opposite of that that thought, that idea, um, that have articulated this idea of being a lone ranger in their faith. Um, They have articulated a desire to practice their faith in isolation. A lot of the times this is related to bad experiences in the church, so they've experienced some sort of hurt on behalf of the church. They were a part of the body. Being a part of the body caused them to get burned and to feel pain in that process. And as a result, they seek to disconnect as much as they can. And I don't want to make light of that tension at all. There's probably more empathy that I could have in my voice as I just said what I did. I've known some people over the years that have really experienced some awful things under the banner of church, religion, Christianity, any of those things, where you would hope a church might step in and fulfill a need and rise to the occasion. Instead, there's been mistreatment, there's been sin, and it's awful. It's hard. And so they become an island pursuing a relationship with Jesus on their own. And there's absolutely a level of nuance working through some of those things. But I can tell you for certain that this early group of believers knew nothing of that kind of isolation. For them, asking a believer if they need to be in unity with a loving church is like asking if a child benefits from being in a loving, caring, 
family and household than having parents that love and care and pour into them? Of, of course it does. Of course it's helpful for that to be the case. Of course a child is better off to have parents that are invested in them, that love, that care about them, to have a family unit that rallies behind them and helps them grow, to pick them up when they're down. And in the same way, being unified with believers is also important for us. Acts 1 makes clear that this soon-to-be church went out of its way to pray together and to seek gospel-centered unity together. It was one of their core values. David captures, I think, well the heartbeat of this text in his Song of Ascents in Psalm 133.1. It says this, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And so the believers in this text are practicing obedience. They're seeking unity in prayer. And then in verses 15 through 22, we see them elevating and leaning on, obeying the scriptures. How are they doing that? Well, for the first time since Jesus has gone back to be with the Lord, we see this soon-to-be church face a problem. There's a tension. There's an issue that they have to step in and address for those that were in this upper room, Judas's actions all the way back in the gospel story, his betrayal is still causing issues. Luke's focus at this point in the story, and, and there's a lot of Christians that get to this part of the story and start to ask a lot of big questions about Judas, really good, mindful, sharp questions about Judas, his faith, his eternity, where it all lies. But, but I do want to pause this morning. Um, it seems very much as though Luke's focus is not on the fate of Judas. Um, Luke's writing this to talk about the positive advancements being made by this future church. Judas is a character in this text, but he's not a main character. What's central here is the fact that this church is tasked with naming his replacement. And it does beg a really important, I think really applicable question for us. When you and I are in a position where we have a big decision on the table, we've got something that we have to decide and flesh out. What is it that we do? What's our process? What does it look like to make decisions in a way that's healthy? And I don't mean small, where should we go to eat, those kind of decisions. I mean these big, weighty crossroads that you and I come to in life where we feel the weight. This decision that we make is going to have some implications and leave a ripple one way or another. There's a philosopher named Beverly D'Onofrio that said this one time, one day can make your life, one day can ruin your life. Essentially, when you look back over your life, you'll see that it's determined by decisions you made on four or five days that really changed everything. So how do you and I go about navigating these kind of life-defining decisions? I can tell you exactly what this group of early believers does in this situation, is the first thing that they do is they lean on God's word. It's Peter that we see standing up and giving a speech. And it's really interesting to see him, of all people, be the one to step up and speak with this kind of eloquence, to talk in this way. Remember, Acts is part two of a story that began back in the Gospel of Luke. And if you've read through the Gospel of Luke recently, you'll notice very quickly that Peter does not often speak with this kind of spiritual maturity. This is the same man that looked Jesus in the eye at one point in the story and said, surely you won't die. This is the story that yielded the response, get behind me, Satan, from Jesus. The same man who was persistent that he would never deny the Lord. It's Peter that we see confidently getting up and speaking to the fact that the scriptures must be fulfilled. There's some real character development happening here in Peter's life. And that's important to be mindful of because as we get to Acts 2 next week and we see the coming of the Holy Spirit, if you think that this step is encouraging by Peter, Wait until you see the impact that God's Spirit makes on his heart and life. Peter's story that we'll see, one that ebbs and flows all through the book of Acts. But in this speech that he gives, Peter quotes two prophetic psalms, both of them in Acts 1.20. The first is from Psalm 69.20. Peter connects this with Judas's place among the disciples. And so when the psalmist writes, let his dwelling become desolate, let no one live in it. Peter concludes that he was speaking about their situation with Judas, who had disqualified himself from service. And then he quotes Psalm 109.8, which says, let someone else take his position. And so they come to the conclusion that the next step for the church is to find someone to replace this fallen disciple. The actions that these folks are taking are not based on need. They're not based on logistics. And so there's a way of reading this text where you come to the conclusion. It makes sense for them to make a replacement for Judas. One twelfth of the work isn't being done. Everyone else is picking up the slack. They may need a new money keeper or bookkeeper. 
But that is not at all the driving force behind why the church is doing what they're doing. Their decision is completely centered around a foundation on scripture. They know the word of God, and now we see them taking tangible actions to walk in step with it. And so they're obeying God's word, they're elevating it. What else should we do as we seek God's will in the midst of big decisions? Verses 23 through 26 bring our text to a close with an emphasis on trusting God's sovereignty. And so the text tells us that there's two men that come forward. We've got Joseph, who's called Barsabbas, not to be confused with Barabbas from the Gospels, or Barnabas from later on in the book of Acts, who's also called Justice. And we see a man named Matthias. They have to decide which of these two is going to be the replacement. If it were up to me, I might pick the latter, the one with the least amount of names, just to keep it interesting, until Joseph can figure out which way he's going with that. Um, But for them... The early believers cast lots to figure out what to do. If you're unfamiliar with that term in the Old Testament, the idea of casting lots is not dissimilar to the modern roll of the dice. They assigned each one a value, cast lots, and trusted it as the Lord's will. So what's the actionable application here for us? The the idea of casting lots in the Old Testament is actually pretty consistent. You you see it throughout the Old Testament. You see it in Joshua 18. There's a situation, the people are determining God's will, and God uses lots to make his will clear. You see it all over the book of First Chronicles, and so offices and functions of the temple, what are we going to do in these situations? The people cast lots, the Lord honors it. We see it in the book of Jonah when the sailors are in the midst of the storm. They're trying to figure out who's at fault. They cast lots, and interestingly enough, the Lord honors it and uses it to reveal that it's Jonah and his sin causing all of it. And so when you and I are in the midst of a big decision, do we get to take up our dice and treat it as easy as that? That's a silly question. But I think it is an important one because I can think back over seasons of my life where I have genuinely wanted to know the Lord's will And there's been a bit of wrestling to try to determine what it is. I'm a believer. I have a Christian worldview. I trust in God's sovereignty. I want my life to be walking in step with the Lord, especially in those four or five decisions that seem to lay out how life is going to look and define what it looks like in seasons. But how do I go about determining what God's will is? I'm certain that I'm not alone in that. I'm confident that many of you have spent much energy and stress. You've labored to understand what God desires as you make a big decision. The idea of casting lots isn't an option. And if you're curious, the Holy Spirit's really what changes that. We no longer need to rely on this sort of method because we have the Spirit of God working as a guide, as a counselor, as a convictor in our lives. But I say all of that to get to this point. We can't follow this early church's example in casting lots, but this group does set an example that I think is really helpful for us today. The faith and the trust in God that these believers are exercising is absolutely something that we can learn from. I'm thinking of a couple of groups in the room specifically. Uh, One, first and foremost, I'm thinking of the high school student, uh, upperclassmen, uh, maybe the college student, young adult, that has people coming up to you all the time asking, hey, what's this next part of your life going to look like? And some of you may have a good answer. You've got a plan in place. Some of you may be thinking, I really don't have a clue what this looks like. I'm trying to figure out what God's will is for me. What should I do with my life? Where should I go to school? What should I pursue? What's God's plan? I'm thinking of the military family who's got some big decisions coming up on the horizon. Maybe you've had a say in what the next season in your life looks like in terms of location and setting. Maybe you haven't. Maybe some of you are looking at life outside the military for the first time and you're trying to piece together what's God's will for my life in this season? What does God have in store for me? I'm thinking of the couple trying to discern what the future of their family looks like, what kids look like, what the timeline for that might entail. And on the other side, I'm thinking of adults that are navigating the idea of an empty nest for the first time, asking, what does it look like to be faithful? What is the Lord's will in this season? Or the senior adult learning how to follow the Lord well during this season of life. Wherever you may find yourself on the spectrum of discerning God's will, this early church gives us practical steps to consider walking. Once again, they go to the Lord in prayer. They're seeking his will through prayer. They trusted that God fully knew the hearts of all of those in the room. They trusted that God knew what he was doing. 
They trusted that he was in control of all things. And they trusted that one way or another, God was going to provide them with an answer. They were obedient, they trusted, and they waited. As you seek to follow Jesus, join together in prayer, obey God's word, and trust in his sovereignty. You know, if we take a minute and zoom out, look at our story together from a big picture perspective, there is one big thing that you and I do not have in common with this church in Acts 1. They're waiting on the Holy Spirit. They're in a season where they're restrained from living out the call in Acts 1.8. And as they're waiting, they're doing all of these things we've talked about. They're practicing obedience. They're praying together, seeking unity, obeying the Lord. They're trusting God's will. All as they wait to be unleashed. But you and I are not waiting in the same way. This morning, you and I have the Holy Spirit. We have the command in Acts 1.8. There's nothing holding us back from living that out today and this week. But I do think this is a good time for us to pause and to remind ourselves that we're not waiting in the same way. But you and I are still waiting on something. We're not waiting for the coming of the Spirit, but we are waiting for the return of Christ. And because of that, we're living in this now, not yet. We're still living in a similar tension where we know that something's coming that is going to be earth-shattering and world-changing, but it's not here yet, and so we're in this in-between In the same way that this outline helped the early church to wait well for the Spirit, I think this morning this outline helps us to await Christ's return in a way that's healthy as well. And as we begin to land the plane this morning, I also can't help in my own mind to compare two of these characters that we've talked about today. And so on one hand we have Judas, and on one hand we have Matthias, the fallen apostle and his replacement. For one, for Judas, his story really is tragic. From everything I read in scripture, his faith and his eternity are very much in question. And we see his story end in our text in this clumsy suicide attempt. And on the other hand, we see this character, Matthias, who receives very little glory in scripture. Much of his life is full of unknowns. There's really only one thing that we can say with confidence about Matthias' life. And that's that he devoted it as much as he could to being a witness for King Jesus in his life and ministry. And so if you're in the room this morning and you don't have a Christian testimony for the unbeliever that might be with us, I can't help but to pause for a moment and wonder and even ask out loud, is there one of these two characters' story that your heart and your story aligns most with? And I don't mean that question in a way that's offensive or in a way that's leading. When we think of Judas' story, it ends with him having betrayed the Lord. It's synonymous with villainy, with betrayal, and it's awful. And it leaves most of us in the room asking questions like, how could this happen? How could a person do something this awful, this wicked? But when we think of God's word as a whole, and especially as we think of texts like Ephesians chapter 2, Paul reminds us that without the gospel, without the transforming power of Christ, All of us are exactly this wicked and this evil. Without the gospel, we are all dead in our sins. We're walking with Satan. We're deserving of God's wrath. Judas's end is an all too sobering experience, a reminder of the fact that repentance is important. If you've never recognized and repented of your sin, if you've never leaned into a relationship with the Lord through the power of the gospel, I have to ask this morning, what is holding you back from experiencing transformation today? The gospel has the power to completely transform your story, to bring you from spiritual death to spiritual life, to take you from walking with the enemy to being seated with Christ and going from being deserving of God's wrath to being a recipient of grace, much like it does for Matthias. For those of you in the room who are believers, who have a testimony of making that decision and leaning into the gospel, one question for you, is your walk with the Lord like that of Matthias? Are you in a season right now where you're seeking to follow Jesus, seeking to be his witness, where your faith to Jesus is strong and your commitment to him true? You know, if you read all of scripture, this is the only time Matthias is mentioned in God's word. This disciple, this apostle, one of the 12, we get this one text and no others that mention his story. There are a couple of pieces in history, so historical perspective that can help us piece together to get this this image of what his life and ministry look like. It's blurry, but I think it's helpful for us this morning. Who was Matthias? It's believed that he first preached in Judea. 
It's believed from there in an Acts 1-8 fashion, he transitioned to a place called Colchis uh, in the modern Republic of Georgia, just outside the Black Sea. And it is there that he preached the gospel so faithfully and so fervently and so passionately that like is often the case for the early church, persecution came about and his life was brought to the end. You can read stories of a lot of different accounts of how he died, but it is clear that he met his end because of his relationship with the Lord. He was martyred for his faith. And because of his faith in Jesus, by all accounts, his story continues in heaven with the Lord. How beautiful is a story like that? A live one's life committed to the task of going and making disciples, to suffer for the cause of Christ, to enter eternity, and to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. This is Matthias' account, and that's not to his credit. It's to the credit of the gospel. This is what the power of the gospel does. It transforms lives. It saves hearts, cleanses hearts, and it equips men and women to live out the commission to be witnesses all over the earth. If you're in the room and you've trusted King Jesus and you're seeking to grow in your capacity and your ability to live for him today, this week, this month, this year, Acts 1, 12 through 26 compels us. As you seek to follow Jesus, join together in prayer, obey God's word, and trust in his sovereignty. Would you pray with me? Father, we really do thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for texts like this. Um, Father, especially as a church that is considering prayerfully and intentionally what it looks like to plant a church, to see a new work started somewhere in this community. Father, we thank you so much for the example of what it looked like for the first church to begin, to be launched. Um, Father, we pray that we might learn from this example to do these things, to be obedient to you, to trust you, to be quick to pray, not in isolation, but together, and to trust that you're in control of all things. And Father, even for those of us in the room who may be short for Jacksonville and may transition to a place where church planning isn't even on the horizon or on the radar at all, Father, we thank you for an example from Acts chapter 1 of what it looks like to simply be a group of believers seeking to follow you and grow in relationship with you. Father, I pray that this week that whatever it looks like, we might lean into some of these disciplines, Father, that we might consider how our relationship is with prayer, with your word, with trusting you in the midst of hard situations. And Father, we pray that your word would lead us to sharpen those things. And Father, especially, we pray that we would do all of that centered in the gospel. Father, whether it be for the first time, for salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins, or the first time today, leaning into the gospel, resubmitting to it, and recommitting ourselves to following you. Father, certainly we pray that would be the case. Father, we love you. We thank you for the chance to worship you this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.